Good morning, Hosanna. I am Jeff Burkholder, Director of Technical Ministries for uh, Hosanna, a fellowship of Christians. And thank you for joining us for our virtual church service this morning. We've got our welcome right here, which you're watching with me. Shortly, we're going to have a couple of songs from our worship team. And then uh, Tony and Joanne, our senior pastors, will then be bringing our message today on the gospel. Uh, before we get started, though, I uh, did want to touch base about a couple of things as far as our offering is concerned. Um, our Change for Change monies for the months of January, February, and March, they're going to be going to a Christian nonprofit organization in Ephrata called Blessings of Hope. It's a food bank or a food distribution service for other nonprofits. They receive large quantities of food break it down into manageable sizes for nonprofits to distribute to people in need. And some of our Hosanna folks volunteer with Blessings of Hope. So uh, our Change for Change monies will be going towards them for the next couple of months. And speaking of offering, uh, if you would like to um, uh, provide an offering for the church, even though we're not meeting together in person, really easy to do so. Uh, I'm going to post a link, hopefully, right here to uh, PushPay that will uh, allow you to donate online. And if you have any other questions or need information about Hosanna, hopefully right here will appear a link for our website. Thank you so much, and here comes the worship team. All I see, you remember. 
pessoa. Good morning, Hosanna. <laughs> Good icy morning, Hosanna. <laughs> oh my, we didn't anticipate, uh, well, we did anticipate this the last couple of days and so sorry that we're not able to be able to be together in person this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, isn't it wonderful that we have this technology and we've done this so many times before that we, um, we have the blessing of being able to revert to it rather than to take the risk of uh, sending people out on icy roads. And for all of you that are, that are sick or quarantining this morning, we're praying for you as well. Oh, it's uh, we started 2022 with um, in an interesting way, didn't we? Mm -hmm. But we did have Christmas. Are you still enjoying what you got for Christmas? I'm wearing today a Star Trek sweater. Surprise, <laughs> surprise, given by a dear friend. And I'm really happy about that. Um, and by the way, we're both happy that God has given Hosanna a couple of awesome Christmas presents as well. So we're going to begin today's message by telling you about a couple of those exciting things. First, First, Julie Campbell and Rick McKinney have agreed to co-lead our worship team, which mm -hmm. is awesome. There was my slippery road um, slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, you, as you know, things have been uh, have changed an awful lot this this fall. And we spent the last several months just watching and praying. This team has done outstanding things to make sure we're led in the presence of God each Sunday. And they've been experimenting and collaborating and being flexible with each other. And and Joanna and I have just been watching. We've really appreciated how Rick and Julie and others have stepped up and filled a very, very big gap. Yeah. Uh, we, don't, we don't know what the long-term future looks like for that yet, but for the time being, both both we and the team are in very good hands with our friends giving some guidance and support for this critical ministry. So um, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Rick, for being who you are. And that's all. They're just being who they are. And yeah. as it turns out, uh, that's a very good thing right now for the team as a whole. Rick has been involved in leading worship from pretty much the time he arrived here. <laughs> I found, Where did you find that, that picture? This old picture. I actually got one that's even older, but uh, this one this one looked like Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't around back then. This is way back in the 80s is when he yeah. arrived. He served on staff at Hosanna, what was then Littis Baptist Church. And as you know, probably if you've been around any length of time, he's part of our teaching team. We very much appreciate that. Yeah. He and Beth are so wonderfully encouraging to the two of us in particular, but to all the staff and, mm -hmm. and to so many of you. And if you know Rick at all, you know that the Rick and Beth, they give themselves freely to take care of so many people. And that's of all ages. So here's another of Rick's personas that is deeply meaningful to us yeah. and, uh, and with so little fanfare. So uh, now that Rick has retired from his day job, he's got some time on his hands. We keep tapping into that time and he's <laughs> really generous in giving it to us. So we, we just prayed and um, I just thought that we were, um, we were being led to ask Rick, uh, Rick to uh, rejoin the Hosanna staff. Yes. And he's serving now as our volunteer pastor of care ministries. Mm -hmm. And that officially started January 1. We just finally got the good opportunity to let you guys know about that. So in that role, he's working alongside Deb. He's working with the elders. He's working with us. And um, just to deepen the care that you all give to one another. And um, we, we're just so grateful for our, for our friend and our brother. So thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> and one of the things I love about each of these announcements is that they are about a male and a female sharing leadership. You know, that's a core value here at Hosanna is what Joanne and I try to model as senior pastors. It's what the elders do. They have male and female leadership. It's what we've done within this, the, um, the office staff. And, and now we see it happening in these ministries as well. So that, that makes us happy. Yes. Yes. Well, those announcement, announcements are definitely good news, um, especially as we continue to move forward into the, the new season that God has for us. Um, and there will likely be other good news announcements as well as we move along. So we look forward yes. to that. Maybe Tony will find some old pictures of some others of you. <laughs> And put them up on the screen on an icy morning. We'll see. How many of you want to see an old picture of Joanne from the 80s? I'll, I'll go out and try to find one. If, um, um, if you better that. run that by me first. <laughs> My sister gave me one the other day that all I could say was, why didn't you help me? 
<laughs> the hair was a little out of control. Anyway, but <laughs> we digress. And anyway, here's the here's the segue um, into this morning's message. Um, the good, all this good news that we've been sharing and these announcements we've been making. The question is, are they gospel? After all, that's uh, what the word gospel literally means. The word gospel means good news. It means a happy announcement, a positive message. The Greek word is euangelion. Um, it's a much used word in the Bible. In fact, it's used over 70 times in the New Testament. It's a much used word in the church, and it's often used in our interactions with the world outside the church. And that seems fitting, actually because the word gospel is, is not unique to Christians. It was a much used word in their first century world as well. I guess good news is good news wherever it's found. Um, and since so much has been packed into this one little word in the past 20 centuries, we thought it was time to unpack it for such a time as this. So as we announced last Sunday, this one good, happy, positive word will be our theme for 2022. That said, Tony, can you say a bit about what has been packed into that word? Maybe something about how that word has been understood over time? Indeed. In fact, it's had a number of different meanings. And we, let's talk about what we mean by gospel or, or the gospel. Let's stop for a moment and think. How did you first become a Christian? Did someone share? the gospel with you? Have you shared the gospel with others? What, what we mean by that phrase is, is usually something like, well, like what, a short summary, a presentation of a set of important beliefs about the salvation that God offers through Jesus' death and resurrection. This is an invitation to come into the, to, to be a Christian. Um, it's an invitation to hear and receive the good news that Christ has died for our sins. And this is the first, and it's the most narrow meaning of the word gospel. Now, these short presentations and summaries uh, sometimes come kind of prepackaged for us in all sorts of varieties. And I learned a whole bunch of these when I was younger. I was taught, uh, for instance, the Romans road to salvation. And there's five verses that you can kind of walk somebody through and, and guide them toward receiving the love of God. There's the famous uh, four spiritual laws developed by Bill Bright, which does a similar thing and um, was very, very popular in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, I had also learned somewhere along the way in AB BC method, to which I eventually added a D, and I used this as a young pastor to help people understand what, um, uh, what the gospel was. And my mother, who taught Good News Club, there's that word again, Good News <laughs> Gospel Club for decades, would teach us about the wordless book. And maybe mm -hmm. even if you're familiar with the wordless book worm, <laughs> different colors, that you could teach kids and what the different colors meant about the good news. So th these are all kind of prepackaged ones. There's nothing wrong with them if they're helpful. Um, but th th sometimes the short summaries actually came in less packaged ways, in more informal ways, like like the altar call at, the, at a revival service. That's that's where I made my first mm -hmm. um, profession of faith in Christ, or 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 the Billy Graham service, something like that. Or or maybe this doesn't maybe happen as often as it would be good, but a very personal invitation from a friend to receive Christ. Maybe you've done that. And they sit down with someone and said, hey, I'd like to tell you about what Jesus means to me. And then you talk it through a little bit. And um, it doesn't have to be long and complicated. It's short and simple. And it's primarily about, um, about receiving Christ's love. In the ancient church, the gospel that we're talking about here, the short summary was distilled down to three phrases that are still recited weekly in some church liturgical church traditions. And we've done it occasionally at Hosanna as well. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. That's gospel. That's good news. And the response to that gospel in the ancient world was something really radical. It was dangerous. And it was also life-changing to them. They would say, Jesus is Lord. Yeah. So he has died, he has risen, he will come again, and he is Lord, and Lord of everything, but particularly Lord of me. I could get a Christian persecutor, could get him even killed. And to this day, to say Jesus is Lord is still a very countercultural thing to say. That is, if we mean it, and it's not just, not just words that we're doing. So all of this is indeed gospel. It's a core and critical and central portion of it, at least. 
There are two problems, however, that sometimes arise with this very narrow understanding of the gospel. One is when we would present these summaries in ways that don't sound like the good news that they really are. And so often I've heard presentations of these and probably did a few myself over the years. I, I think perhaps when I was a teenager in college, I was wandering through the streets of Harrisburg one night, stopping people and saying, do you know you're going to hell? Uh, that doesn't exactly start a conversation on a positive, <laughs> a positive uh, direction to be able to talk about the love of Jesus, you know? So, uh, so some of these in, in, you know, presentations are a little more off-putting than inviting. And some are more about scaring people away from hell than about the good news that heaven has come to us, which is what Jesus was talking about. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's no wonder that so many people are afraid of God or tick to God because uh, maybe sometimes, sometimes because of the way that we presented him. And that sort of witness kind of defeats the purpose that we're trying to get at. So God loves you. And that God has done everything necessary for you to be able to love him back and, uh, li and live eternally in that love. The other problem with these short summaries is that if we think that they're all the good news, as if everything else that God has done is, is irrelevant or maybe imply that it's bad news, mm -hmm. as wonderful as this core message is, the gospel is much more than that. It's so much more than that, which is what the scriptures reveal. And Joanne will tell us about that. A right. So when we think about the word gospel... As Tony just said, we think of the gospel. And perhaps another thing that comes to mind are the gospels from scripture. Um, the gospels, the first four books in the New Testament with gospel in their titles. Literally, each title um, of those first four books reads the same. It says the good news according to Matthew, the good news according to Mark, the good news according to Luke, the good news according to John. They all have the same titles with that word good news, euangelion, in the titles. The first three gospels are called the synoptic gospels because they include much of the same material, many of the same accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. They're often using the same sequencing of, of events and sometimes even the identical wording. By the year 200, the fourth gospel, John's gospel, came to be called the spiritual gospel because it was a bit different from the first three. It was the last one written and it tells the story of Jesus in a more symbolic or even poetic way. The gospels, the four of them, they all contain both similar and different information. They all offer unique perspectives of, of Jesus meant for particular people. So for example, Matthew's gospel was written primarily for the Jewish community in Jesus' day, while Luke's gospel was fo focused more on Gentile, non-Jewish readers. And all four of them proclaim to everyone the same good news. The good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and what he continues to do for all of us. So no wonder, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Mark began the first of the four Gospels, the first written one, by writing in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. When I was ordained, I knelt on a worship platform in an old camp meeting tabernacle. This was awesome. And the bishop laid his hands on me and said as solemnly as I've ever heard anybody talk. Anthony, call me by my full name, had a bit of a funny, funny accent. Anthony, take thou authority to <laughs> preach the gospel. <laughs> yeah, he actually talked like that. And he said thou, because I guess if you use King James English, it sounds even more solemn. But it, man, it was a very meaningful moment for me. Mm -hmm. But even then, I knew something was not quite right in what he said. I didn't need the dear bishop's blessing to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'd already been doing that for years at that point, um, officially as a pastor, but I had been doing it in other ways even before that. 
That's because Jesus had already come authorized. Jesus had commanded, invited, encouraged all of us to do that. Before he ascended into heaven, this is at the end of the Gospel of Mark now, he gathered his disciples and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now, keep in mind that the word preach here did not just mean what Joanne and I and others do in front of crowds. It wasn't formal preaching. It had a wider meaning of to proclaim or present. Somehow, get the news out. And that admonition, by the way, wasn't just for the original disciples who were gathered around Jesus that day, or the church would have died out when they did. Obviously, the implication was that all of the disciples would would proclaim this, would uh, give this good news, and that the, the next ones along would keep on doing this. And this is what the church gets to do. It's for all who follow Jesus. All have received the good news and live like it's true. So. What was the gospel that Jesus and my bishop were encouraging me to preach? Um, just the first four books of the New Testament? Of course not. I had a fuller Bible than that. Was he referring to just that short packaged invitation to invite others to follow Jesus? And again, of course not. Now, I did know some pastors who thought so. I followed one who pastor for years and he preached a basic salvation message every single Sunday to the same people, most of whom had received Christ in their if not longer. There was a woman in there who was a, who was about 90 who said something like, yeah, I've, I've, I've heard, you know, I, I said to Christ when I was six. I've heard this before. And I let's just say this was an entire congregation of baby Christians. Mm. <laughs> they didn't know. And they did not act, I have to say it, they did not act. They acted like baby Christians too. They didn't know that there was far more good news in the good news. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what to do with me when I started talking about the rest of the gospel outside of that very true but very narrow invitation to receive Christ. You see, the gospel is bigger and better than just that. Yep. The gospel was already about Jesus before he died and rose again. Yep. The Greek word euangelion, as, as, as Joanne said, is found all over the New Testament, sometimes in reference to Christ's death and the salvation that it offers, but in many other contexts as well, including in Jesus' own life and ministry, he used the word. And when he talked about the gospel, he was not saying um, just the fact that someday I'm going to die and rise again from you. He called it the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. And it included all that he taught and demonstrated about the goodness of humanity. If you think about it, we do need, we do have, and we need the rest of the story. Otherwise, our Christmas celebration really wouldn't amount to too much, would it? Because the Christmas we celebrate that God is with us, right? Emmanuel. That's part of the gospel of the kingdom. God's loving presence with humanity. Yeah. And here's another one, a popular part of what Jesus talked, uh, gave us was the Beatitudes, where Jesus tells us wonderful news, gospel, that the kingdom of God, that in the kingdom of God, the ways of the world are reversed, and the first are last, and the last are first, and the poor are rich, and the hungry are satisfied. It's gospel. So in one sense, the whole New Testament is about the gospel, yeah. hardly understood. So when a child asks you to read them a story, you don't just open up their favorite book and read page 26 every single time, do you? <laughs> they want the whole that. story. I, you tr I tried that when Jared was little. You just go to the, you know, you skip a few pages. And it is like, no, mommy, you forgot <laughs> page 25. <laughs> it's, they know the story <laughs> or they want to know the story, the whole story, yeah. not just page 26. Yeah. So the same thing is true of the gospel. It's a bigger and better story than maybe we sometimes believed or sometimes presented to the world. Yeah. So these ways of understanding the good news of Jesus, the gospel, the gospels, and the gospel of the kingdom, they're already familiar to most of us, especially at Hosanna. We talk about these things a lot, but just notice that our theme this year is gospel without the little word, the now, it's not that there's anything wrong with the written gospels or the preached gospel. Of course not. And we all need some way to be able to condense down the, to the basic message of what Jesus did at the gospel. 
and be able to say that to others. Nothing wrong with any of that, of course not. It's just that as Tony has said, we limit the depth and scope and goodness of all that God has done, is doing, and will do through Christ when we say that only certain written words or spoken words about Jesus are the gospel. So this year, we want to let the Holy Spirit unpack the rest of the story, unpack the fullness, the beauty, the wonder of the incredible good news of Jesus Christ, so that we can live gospel and become gospel, so that everything we say and do is good news for the people around us. Yes. So that means that, that the good news that we announced earlier about Rick and Julie is indeed gospel. But listen, it also means that the loss of our brother, John Noel, to ALS this week is also gospel. Because as sad as his wife, Linda, is, and many of us are, about his death, the good news, gospel, is that he is now free to laugh and to sing and to move and to dance and to celebrate the reality that, in essence, gospel is not simply knowing ideas or words about what God and Jesus have done, are doing, and will do. Gospel is knowing Christ and revealing the eternal good news of who Jesus was, is, and always will be through our lives right here on earth as it is in heaven so that we become an answer to his prayer. And when we live like this, what will our lives words and actions announce about God's gospel of good news? Well, Tony's going to tell us, we're going to tell you together, but he's going to start what this can mean for us. It's actually an awful lot. Yeah. Our lives, words, and actions will first of all announce that gospel is true. Yep. Because God is the fullness of truth. You know that, don't you? Because yeah. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Yep. Because everything God is and does and says is true. The scripture says that this good news continues on and through us. So the revelation of the true gospel is as real today as the day you first heard of our glorious hope. Now that you have believed in the truth of the gospel. Yes. Yes. And our lives and our words and actions will also proclaim, in addition to gospel truth, that gospel is hope, hopeful, hope-filled, because God is fullness of hope. Yes, God is a God who is the sure anchor of our hope. God holds hope for us. And God also experiences hope because we in our world are not yet what God longs and created us to be, right? So God is hope, has hope, and holds hope for us. And God never gives up. God continues to encourage us with hope-filled gospel good news, like Paul did for his Colossian brothers and sisters when he said, continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. And gospel is great, is gracious, because God is fullness of grace. Mm -hmm. Jesus is grace given to us by God. Uh, the apostle Paul spoke of this when he said, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task. The Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying what? To the good news of God's grace. One of my favorite words in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's me. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was agreeing with you. I like those words too. Grace, yeah. grace, grace. And there's more. There's more. When we live gospel, our words and actions will also reveal that gospel is glorious because God is fullness of glory and light. And in that light, our eyes are, are opened to behold the glory, the glory of God, the real presence of God who's here with us right now in Jesus and who wants to open everyone's eyes to see. Glory. Right, glory. And God wants that because, um, as scripture says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe 
so that they would not see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. And gospel, in, in addition to being all those things, is also joyful because God is fullness of joy itself. Yeah. And so we can agree with Nehemiah that the joy of the Lord, not just, by the way, the joy in the Lord. It's not just that we're joyful because God has done good things, but the joy of the Lord. You, could you imagine God being joyful? Is that your image of God? Mm -hmm. It says the joy of the Lord, God's own joy is my strength. Yep. And we could go on and on with scriptures extolling the fullness of God that is revealed through the good news of gospel. But we have a whole year to do that. <laughs> So for now, let's simply add that gospel is love because God is love. So gospel is amazing good news about God, about Jesus, about Trinity. And here's some more good news. When we enter into faith relationship with God in Christ, what is true of Christ becomes true of us. In him, we become gospel too. We become good news for the world too. So what might that gospel good news look like in us, in our everyday world? Tony? Well, let's go back over that list of descriptors. We just they made it made of the gospel. If this is what the gospel is like when we become gospel, then this is what we become like. Mm -hmm. So first, because the truth of the gospel is in us, we are also true. Now, what do I mean by that? When we're one with Christ, truth is no longer just a set of ideas or beliefs or doctrines out there somewhere that we are invited to receive, believe, and achieve. Mm -hmm. Truth actually is in us. Christ's spirit of truth speaks to us, reveals to us, and makes us more true. And that's why we can remain rock solid when other voices outside of us speak things that are contrary to the inner witness of the spirit. And we, we, it's not that we have to prove it necessarily. We just know internally that what is true because of the witness of the spirit in us. And that's why we end up becoming truth tellers to the world. Now, sometimes we talk about telling the truth in our culture anymore. That seems uh, that, that people use that when they talk about pounding on people. We need yeah. somebody to tell the truth. I, I don't know why truth telling always has such a negative connotation. Well, it even feels violent sometimes. Yeah. Telling the truth might disturb people, but it might just delight them to know what is actually true. So um, it means in our case, in a culture that specializes in half-truths and deception and spin and even lies, mm -hmm. the gospel that speaks truth, the good news is really indeed good news. Yeah. Well, it also means that because the hope of the gospel is in us, not only are we true and truth tellers, we are hope filled, hope filled and hope infusers. Now, listen, this does not mean when we say we're hope filled, it doesn't mean we're going to feel emotionally full of hope all the time. Obviously not. I mean, especially now we're living in a time when cynically snuffing out hope seems to be a full time occupation for lots of people. But gospel hope isn't based on our feelings. It's based in God's fulfilled promises. We are full of hope because the God who is hope, the God of hope lives in us. That's what fills us with hope, God's hope, God's presence. So God's hope remains in us even when we feel exhausted or discouraged. Gospel hope is seeing reality for what it is um, and choosing to trust again and again the good news that Jesus is still here no matter how bad things may look. And Jesus is still your way and my way, our way, truth and life, even when we have no clue which direction to take. And Jesus will never leave, especially in our darkest moments. And it also means that God is still somehow working all things together for goodness in your life and mine. Because the gospel of hope is in us, we are hope-filled gospel. And able to be hope infusers, what, what do we mean by that? People who carry hope for others, like God does, and instill hope into others, like God does, just like I'm trying to do for you right now. <laughs> I'm remembering um, one of the classes that uh, 
uh, I helped us to facilitate, I think probably two years ago now, was the study of First Peter. And um, the whole point of First Peter was to uh, to encourage the people at that time who were going through a, a pretty miserable experience to be people of hope, to live in hope mm -hmm. because of the, the God of hope. Um, and uh, I think it was very relevant. That's not all. Yeah. Because the grace of the gospel is in us. We are also graced. Now, maybe that's not a word you use to describe yourself. It's a really cool adjective. I decided a little while back that when you all eventually get around to holding my funeral, I, I by the way, I'm still thinking that's a long time away in a galaxy far, far away. But whatever it happens, <laughs> I want the theme to be a graced life. I'm just to realize how much grace um, has flowed into me from God and from all of you. And that's not just true for me. It's for all of us. All humans have been graced by God. But I tell you, those of us who have received the love of Christ, we swim in grace. Yes. We breathe in grace. Grace is what we wake up to every morning. And it's all around us all the time. If we'll but open our eyes and notice it and see it and celebrate it. Mm -hmm. And then when we're aware of that, when we're reveling in the grace, it's easy then to be grace givers. We don't have to be the, 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 the tight, hard image that so many people have of Christians or religious people in general. We can be givers of grace to the world who we display in our words and in our actions and then proclaim the good news of God's amazing grace for everybody. Yeah. And if all of that's not enough, there's more. Because the glory of gospel is in us, we are glorious and glory shiners. So Jesus said, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill, glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light, let it shine for all. Let your good deeds glow for all to see so that they will praise your heavenly father. You know, now there's so much talk about how dark our world is, how dark our nation is. Well, okay, that means that now is the time for the body of Christ to shine like never before. And that's gonna happen as, as each of us does as Jesus instructed us to do, by choosing to come out of hiding, take off the coverings, you know, those bushel baskets he talked about. To, nobody puts a bushel basket over a light in a house. What's the point? We need to come out of hiding, take off the coverings that we use to dim our light and then shine brightly without shame, without apology to shine from the inside out with the glory of the risen one. See, it's not our ego shining. It's him shining from within us out. We have lived for too long, small lives of fear. It's time to shine for yeah. all to see, Hosanna. It's time. It's time to live in the reality um, that a, a story from the Christian desert tradition teaches us. I love this story. And it's so true if we're willing, if we're courageous enough. The story is this. Abba Lot went to see Abba Joseph and said to him, Abba, as far as I can say, I do my little office. I read my Psalms. I fast a little bit, I pray and I meditate. I live in peace with others as far as I can. I purify my thoughts. Tell me, Father, what else? What more can I do? Then the old man, Abba Joseph, he stood up and he stretched out his hands toward heaven. And his fingers became like 10 lamps of flame. And he said, if you will, you can become all fire. Oh, all fire. We need to light up the night, folks. All, all flame. And that flame will exhibit the joy of yeah. the gospel in us if we really do have joy in us. Yeah. If Christ is in us, we are joyous, aren't we? The world settles for a bit of an excitement once in a while, not joy, just a bit of an excitement, the kind of feeling you get when someone hypes up a crowd. So often church worship anymore is, in some places, is just about creating a sense of excitement, having an emotional experience. 
-hmm. or maybe when you're going on an adventure and you have an excitement and something is a little bit thrilling, but the joy is something else and it's deeper and it's better and it's more permanent. Something that persists even through grief and struggle. Yes. It's a rare thing anymore, except among the people of God, yep. the people who really do believe in gospel, which is why one of the most satisfying roles that we have is to be joy bringers to the world. But to point them to the one who is the source of all joy, that is gospel. Wouldn't that be, instead of being afraid of sharing the gospel, because we don't have the prepackaged kind of thing now, what if we were just to bring joy to the world and point people to the source of joy, and they would want to be joyous along with us? Yes. Wonderful good news, that is. And all of that is true. Because the love of gospel is in us. And because... The, the love of gospel is in us. We are lovely and love letters. We are lovely, meaning we are beautiful of soul. We are people who love others in a way that inspires them to love others. We're people who lift other spirits and actually see the best and not only the worst in them. We get to be people others want to be around because we genuinely care and we deeply listen and we pricelessly value them. Scripture says that not only are we lovely, though, we're also God's love letters. Living epistles is what Paul calls it. Paul says we are moving, breathing, walking letters, displaying God's goodness, glory, and grace. And I think that means we are God's love letters, meaning we get to let Jesus love our neighbors and even our enemies through our hearts. And we get to let Jesus look with his love through our eyes at everyone we meet and seeing them, allowing us to see them in ways that heal them rather than hurt them, receive rather than reject and draw them toward Christ rather than pushing them away. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are watching this on video uh, and not just listening to the words and you look at this screen and see all of these descriptions here, we are true, we are hopeful, we are grace, we are glorious, we are joyous, we are lovely, and we're truth tellers, hope infuses, grace givers, glory shiners, joy bringers, love letters, wow, this is already true about you. Yes. This is already true about every single one of us who has received and become gospel. There's nowhere else to get to, there's no, uh, it's there. Yeah, but you're probably sitting there going, I'm not sure that looks <laughs> Describes me fully, and by the way, I'm sitting here going, that doesn't describe me fully yet. None of us are yet living out the fullness of this gospel in our lives. We're in the world. Yeah. We're not living fully in what we already are, what we've already received. Now, do not take heart. I mean, take heart. Do not be discouraged about this because the gospel continues to do its ongoing work in us. It continues to transform us into what we were created to be. It continues to free us from everything that would take us captive. And by the way, the New Testament audiences who were hearing this in the apostles, they were in the same position that we're in. They needed this ongoing work of transformation in their life, just like Paul and Peter and the, the, the gospel writers did. The thing is that the way the life of the spirit is presented sometimes, that some says, it seems that some believe the good news stops at conversion. <laughs> hey, God loves you. We'll forgive you your sins. You can go to heaven. Yay. And then, okay, I'll accept that. And then we're handed a list of burdens and rules and threats. Yes. If you don't do this, you know, and then, no, this work of transformation, the biblical word for it is sanctification. It still remains gospel. It is still good news. Christ in us, Christ with us, Christ for us, reviving us, yes. renewing us, or restoring us. This is good news. Yep. This is not a burden on your shoulders. This is an invitation to even something even better than what we believed at first. And we keep mm -hmm. going to the goodness of it. And that's why when we see that transformation happening in us or in someone else, we delight in it. Yay, God. And when our words and our lives sound like gospel, 
others also the light and the good news lived out in front of them. We really can bring good news simply by the in wonderfully countercultural way that we live our lives. Yes. That's why this is our theme mm-hmm. this year. Mm-hmm. You know what? It is time. It's time for some gospel sharing, gospel trusting, and gospel living among the people of God. It's time for both the church and the world to hear the good news all mm-hmm. over again. Because somewhere along the way, sometimes it's gotten distorted and perverted a little bit. And to hear it this time around as indeed good news. And it's time for all of us to live more fully into it. Instead of just playing around the edges and having, instead of having just a little, uh, a little veneer of gospel on our skin and like a body wash we put it on in the morning, but doesn't really impact who we are. So yeah. that by word and by deed, we testify to gospel at loose in the world. And indeed it is. Yeah. Yes, it's time. It is time to go there. And the attitude in which we'll go there is the same attitude in which God came here. The attitude of Christ Jesus, who so wanted to be with us that he let go of what it meant to be God, Philippians 2 tells us, and came to be with us as one of us, not as a strong, serious, powerful ruler. That's not how he came. That's not the attitude that he came in. He came as a vulnerable, playful, powerless baby. So we just celebrated a month ago, less than a month ago right? He came vulnerable, playful, powerless, and full of the utter joy of God's great good news because he is gospel. He is good news. And that baby grew into a man who delighted. He laughed in delight with the children. And he invites us all to live in that same freedom and fullness of joy. Love that story. It's in Mark 10, Jesus just playing, laughing with the children. That's what gospel looks like. And we want to just let me share with you just one writer's imagining of what it might have been like to be there. This writer says, to see him playing with the children, blessing them, bearing them up in his arms. Well, the disciples are embarrassed with envy. The little one is climbing up his shoulder. The little one exclaims with sheer joy that he is climbing Rabbi Mountain. (laughs) Jesus is laughing. They have never heard him laugh with such ruckus. He is tickled with glee. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will not enter it, he says as he giggles. The disciples are watching the reign of God resurrect a joyful ruckus before them. This joy is that gospel's reward. Each disciple wishes to be a child again, to rush the rabbi and tumble into his arms to enter into this joy. They envy the children. Mm -hmm. Jesus sits before them, laughing with the mystery of a child's joy. Let The little children come. Do not stop them. Jesus is breaking new life into dead lives, broken lives. No one will be held back. Jesus' will is equal to his love. Nothing will be held back. See, that's the good news. That's gospel. That Jesus came into this world just as we do and lived just as he wants us to live in the wonder, the mystery, the joy of being alive in this amazing creation. And you know what? If we'll stop for a moment and listen carefully, we might hear that at the heart of creation is the heart of the creator who laughs with delight as the great good news as gospel continues to outwork gospel in this wonderful world, in this infinite universe, and then on into the eternity of heaven. If we'll stop for a moment and listen carefully, we will not hear the voice of an angry, bad news God. What we will hear is good news beyond anything we could ever imagine. We'll hear the voice of our good news God, echoing in the center of our own hearts, resounding in every moment of our lives, This is what we will hear. 
And this is what we will live. This is the sound of gospel. Jesus would say, with a smile on his face and laughter in his voice, go and do likewise, folks. Go be gospel this week. Amen. See you next week.